Hello everyone. I hope you are ready for new historical mysteries, because this is what I have in store for you tonight. This time, we are seated in a camp near the pyramids of Giza, the setting of our first story. The suburbs of the giant city of Cairo, teeming with life, are near us. But our story takes place more than 4,000 years ago. And as the sun sets, we begin our travel back in time. The buildings disappear. Everything becomes quiet. And the pyramids return to their past splendor. Higher than today. Smooth, white and shiny in the sunset light. A complex reappears at the foot of the Great Pyramid, linking it to the river. And apart from this, all we can now see around us are the sands of ancient Egypt. We have arrived, so let's begin. What we see of the Great Pyramid and the smaller pyramids around it today is its core, its core structure, not what it looked like in the 26th century BC. Back then, when it was brand new and for centuries, the pyramid was covered in smooth, white limestone casing, which made it not only shiny, but also taller than today. It initially stood at 481 feet, that's almost 147 meters. But this outer casing was removed and reused, or it fell out. And this reduced its height by almost 30 feet, or 8 meters. But still, it remained the tallest man-made structure in the world for more than 3,500 years. There are lots of dubious claims about this monument. For example, that it would be proof that the Egyptians had advanced technology. Or that it was built by aliens. This is not what we are going to discuss tonight because these stories about the Great Pyramid are baseless. The pyramids are enormous piles of stones. Their size, their aesthetic, their precision, their function, the social organization that made their building possible, all of these are fascinating topics. But they are just piles of stones. No sign of advanced technology that would have surpassed what ancient Egyptians are credited for was ever found inside or near them. The question is more, how can a society from the 3rd millennium BC, only equipped with technical means that are very rudimentary to us, how and why did it dedicate so much effort to build these monuments? How blocks of this size were cut, brought and put together so tightly, all by hand. Collectively, and despite the loss of mass of the Great Pyramid over the centuries, these blocks represent 92 million cubic feet, that's 2.6 million cubic meters. What were the challenges that architects and workers had to face? And how did they build the pyramid? This is what we are going to examine. We will also visit the inside of the Great Pyramid, and obviously because it is inseparable, 
we will talk about Khufu, the pharaoh for whom the pyramid was built. So to begin with, who was Khufu, also known as Cheops? He was the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty of ancient Egypt, at a time when Egypt had been unified north and south for generations already, and already had an old culture and ancient traditions. But very few of the iconic monuments that represent this civilization nowadays. Khufu succeeded his father, Sneferu, and ruled for a long time, at least 26 years, and possibly up to 46 years, according to modern historians. He could have commissioned other buildings than the pyramid. He probably did, but they were lost, and the only intact certified portrait of the king is a small figurine that was made long after his death. Other statues and reliefs were found in fragments, which is not surprising for a pharaoh who lived four and a half millennia ago. We know next to nothing of what happened during his reign, internally and externally. There are inscriptions mentioning the sending of expeditions to find turquoise and copper mines, or commercial contracts with the city of Byblos in Lebanon. There are also papyrus fragments found fairly recently, 10 years ago, and dating back 4,500 years, the time of Khufu's reign, that are administrative records Letters sent to the pharaoh that shed light on the administration of Egypt at the time. They confirm the sending of food and supplies to sailors or wharf workers. This is valuable, but doesn't tell much of the events that happened during Khufu's reign. So how can we be sure that this pyramid is his? Actually, it was traditionally attributed to Khufu in ancient Egypt, and the first Greek historians wrote about it, endorsing this attribution. But in the Middle Ages, a number of other people were credited with the construction. For example, Nimrod, a biblical figure described as a king in Mesopotamia, or King Sorid, a legendary king from medieval Coptic and Islamic lore. Coptic means that it belongs to the Copts, and the Copts are a Christian ethnic and religious group from Egypt and Sudan. So when the science of Egyptology formed in the 19th century, it was unsure which pharaoh had built the pyramid. Between all these different claims and the absence of visible inscriptions on the pyramid itself. Until 1837, when exploration of the inside revealed new chambers where the workers had marked the blocks with hieroglyphs, graffiti, that gave the names of their gangs, their teams. All these team names referred to Khufu. And later, other inscriptions with the name of Khufu were found at a quarry where the blocks came from. Finally, in the 20th century, more discoveries of tombs on the site of Giza confirmed that the pyramid was Khufu's, because his wives, his children and grandchildren, and also high officials were buried around the site. So there is little doubt at this point that the right attribution was the old one, the one that Greek historians mentioned. Now it is kind of known where the stone blocks came from, how they were extracted and transported, and of course that this pyramid was intended to serve as a tomb. 
but looking at all this in details, there are still plenty of unknowns. So let's take a look at what these unknowns actually are. In total, the pyramid consists of about 2.3 million blocks, and in average, the blocks weigh more than 2 tons, and they are of different materials, different types of stone. The most common blocks are limestone, and most of them were quarried at Giza, just south of the pyramid, so they didn't need to travel very far. It is believed they were brought to the site and placed on kinds of sleds. I'll tell you in a minute about the construction techniques. But there were other materials too. For example, the white casing of the pyramid, which was also limestone, but limestone of a different kind. These blocks came from another quarry, about six miles south of the pyramid, and they were probably transported by boat. We know that specifically because rolls of papyrus from this 2013 discovery I mentioned before describe the deliveries of limestone blocks and other construction materials from this other quarry to the site of Giza in the last year of the reign of Khufu. What is more impressive in terms of distance is the presence of hundreds of blocks of granite that were transported from Aswan in the very south of Egypt all the way north to Giza. The distance was 900 kilometers or 560 miles and the largest of these blocks weigh 25 to 80 tons each. Granite is a very hard stone and these large blocks were used to make different things inside the pyramid, including the roof of a room inside the pyramid called the King's Chamber, we will visit it later, and several other chambers above it called the Relieving Chambers, because their function was to distribute and bear the weight of the blocks above them and avoid a collapse. The technique used to extract granite and other stones is well documented. The Egyptians dug holes in the stone and inserted wooden wedges. They soaked the wood with water and these wedges absorbed it. They expanded and broke off workable chunks of stone. This gave them rough blocks that they could then cut manually to refine them, give them the requested dimensions and polish them. But who works in the quarries and on the site of the pyramid? A widespread belief in the antiquity was that slave labor was used, but it was more based on the beliefs of foreigners especially the Greeks, who practiced slavery on a large scale. The Egyptians also did, but were never big on slavery. And it is another topic, but it is hard to distinguish between various categories of forced and unpaid labor that existed in ancient Egypt. People could be bound for life to a temple or a family but it is not obvious whether they were servants, peasants, or actual slaves in the sense we give to this word, because generally they kept some rights, like having personal possessions, belongings, or contracting transactions willingly, and they could not be sold like assets. So there was a variety of situations and rights. It evolved over time. But the only people with a status that corresponds to the modern definition of slavery were either convicted people who were stripped of their rights as punishment, 
or foreign captives from Nubia or the Middle East. What did exist on a large scale, though, was a system of corvée, that is to say, forced labor for peasants. When they didn't need to work in the fields, they could be drafted to become a workforce, or sometimes an army, that served the pharaohs or local nobles. It is believed the majority of Egyptian large monuments were built like this, by conscript laborers. So they left their villages for a few months, and they were sent to Giza or to quarries to work there. They were fed and given shelter, and then they could return to their families, that their work was a gift or an obligation to the pharaoh. Now, how many workers were necessary? Because the question is, was it possible to cut over two million stone blocks over a period of about 27 years, the construction time of the pyramid? That implies about 250 blocks every day, in average. And this is one of the reasons why some people doubted the pyramid could be built in this time frame, with the rudimentary tools that the Egyptians had at their disposal. So archaeological experiments were made to see how it was possible and if it was possible, with reproductions of Egyptian tools, like copper chisels, wooden mallets, ropes and stone tools. An experiment like this took place in 2017 on an abandoned quarry of Khufu. And it appeared that with these tools, and after they had acquired a bit of experience over a few days, including in particular the discovery that it was much easier when limestone was wetted with water, four workers could extract one two and a half tons block in less than a day. Given the other tasks, given the block the right measurement and uh, polishing it, it was estimated that quarries could have produced 250 blocks a day with a workforce of 3,500 quarrymen. So it kind of checked, because 3,500 men was much less than the workforce a pharaoh of Egypt had at its disposal. Another study of 1999 estimated that, assuming the construction had taken 27 years, the total project would have required an average workforce of about 13,000 people. For example, 3,000 to 4,000 in quarries, and around 10,000 working in transport and construction. There would have been peaks of construction activity in between harvest seasons with up to 40,000 workers and slower periods. But considering that Egypt in the 26th century BC had a population of somewhere between 1 and 5 million, this is another estimate given by Egyptologists, mobilizing 40,000 workers at times of peak activity, looks feasible. These experiments are very valuable because they answer the claims that building the Great Pyramid was impossible with the numbers and the means that the Egyptians had. People did the work of cutting blocks with the same tools, timed it, extrapolated it, and it checks. This was still a huge, complicated task, but not an impossible one. Something that helped build a bit faster is that only the visible external blocks, or the blocks that make the walls of inner chambers, fit together with precision and are perfectly polished. Core blocks, 
the ones that would be invisible once the pyramid was completed, were only roughly shaped, with rubble inserted between larger gaps, and also mortar was used to fill gaps and joints. So only a minority of blocks, still that's tens of thousands, but not all of them, were carefully shaped and polished. The rest was still somewhat precise, but much rougher. Now, apart from the performance of making and assembling so many heavy blocks, the pyramid is also an architectural challenge, a highly precise work. The four sides had almost exactly the same length, 756 feet, 230 meters. The angles are almost perfectly right. The square, that is the base of the pyramid, was measured to have only a very marginal error of 12 seconds of arc, that is to say almost nothing. The length of the sides was exactly 440 cubits, and cubits are an ancient unit of length used by the Egyptians and also the Sumerians that was based on the distance from the elbow to the middle finger. Of course, in constructions it was standardized, like feet are, because this distance varies between people. The slope of the pyramid was also almost perfect, and this slope was actually used in all smooth pyramids, like the ones of Giza, which is why they look the same. They have the exact same proportions. The Egyptians described slopes by counting cubits, how much run for one cubit of rise. In the case of the pyramids, the slope seen as perfect was 14 to 11. This ratio is equivalent to about 51-52 degrees of slope. The pyramid is also closely aligned to the cardinal directions. The sides face the geographic north, east, west and south. Geographic rather than magnetic, because there is a little difference. The magnetic north is the one given by a compass, which points to the magnetic pole. The geographic north and other directions depends on the sun. The Egyptians had no knowledge of the magnetic pole and compasses, so to them the north was geographic, but the difference is very small. How could they achieve this almost perfect alignment with cardinal directions? There are no certainties here, but various theories. One is that they used a vertical rod to track its shadows throughout the day. The circle would have been drawn around the base of the rod and the shadow line intersects with this circle. This way they could have gotten an east-west line and positioned the north and the south by drawing another line at a right angle to it. Or another possibility is that they tracked the pole star, which they knew to indicate the north, and be almost perfectly fixed in the night sky. Or maybe they did it by tracking two other stars, Mizar and Kotchep, that appeared on a vertical line on the horizon, close to the north, by the middle of the 3rd millennium BC. In any case, they did it with one such method, and with great accuracy for the time. They also probably solved other problems with that kind of simple but astute methods. For example, another hypothesis is that to ensure the base of the pyramid was perfectly flat, they could have filled the square with water and checked the level on each side like a kind of giant spirit level. 
All of this shows that, however simple the shape, the building of the pyramid was also an engineering project. It was not just about piling up blocks. It required calculations, anticipation, and the positioning of the building was filled with meaning to the Egyptians. Maybe the biggest question of all is how were these big heavy blocks lifted to the top? There were obviously no cranes or motors, so it had to be entirely built by hand, by pulling or pushing the blocks. As a matter of fact, the blocks placed higher in the structure are smaller, not as thick and somewhat lighter than the blocks near the base. But they still weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds or kilograms. Pyramids from the 4th dynasty, which include all pyramids at Giza, the other smaller ones, were built by Khufu's successors. These pyramids are entirely made of stone blocks. But later, during the Middle Kingdom, in the second millennium BC, the techniques changed, and most pyramids were made internally of mud bricks. And this mountain of bricks was encased in a veneer of polished limestone. So they looked externally the same, but they did not resist the test of time as well. The casing fell, or was taken away, and the bricks deteriorated. This is the reason why later pyramids look older or more damaged than the pyramids of Giza, because they were not as strong internally. Apart from blocks, the Great Pyramid required a large quantity of rubble to fill the gaps between the blocks. As I said before, they were roughly cut when they were not visible. This filling of rubble has almost no binding properties, but it was necessary to stabilize the construction. It also required a lot of gypsum mortar, thousands of tons, and this could be one reason why the building of such big pyramids did not last. Gypsum had to be dehydrated, dehydrated by heating, which required huge quantities of wood. Some Egyptologists have suggested that the building of the pyramids of Giza and a few other earlier pyramids could have stripped Egypt of almost all its forests. Wood was never very abundant in Egypt. The building of these large stone pyramids may have stopped just because there was not enough wood left to go on, or because it became obviously irresponsible. But returning to the question of how the blocks were moved up to the superstructure, there is no known accurate historical or archaeological evidence that definitively resolves the question. So all we have is hypotheses that are possibilities supported by what we know of the Egyptians' capabilities, but certainties they are not. The most tenable of the methods to raise the blocks seem to be ramps, because the slope of the pyramid is way too steep to pull or push blocks up. There is archaeological evidence that ramps were used, but only evidence of small ramps or inclined causeways, not something that could explain the construction method. An early hypothesis was that a large straight ramp was built by piling up earth, and then raised by piling always more as the pyramid went up, but it was discredited on functional grounds, because its mass would have been almost identical to the pyramid itself, 
so that would have implied a huge labor cost to first build it and then eliminate it entirely. And it would be difficult to imagine that it didn't leave a trace, because miles around the site of Giza there was only sand and rock. So how do you build and eliminate such a massive ramp with that? So even though a large single ramp is not technically impossible, most experts discard it. That's the center of the mystery around the building of the pyramid, because other options all have their problems. They include zigzagging ramps, leaning on the structure, or spiraling ramps all the way to the top. And again, these are possible, but how do you make them stick to the structure? And is it really optimal to make these very heavy blocks spiral around the structure and ultimately cover a long distance when you need to add, in average, 200 to 300 blocks per day during 27 years? It is documented that the blocks could travel on important distances on sleds that were pulled with water to lubricate the surface and make it easier. But the difficulties with ramps is the reason why it is speculated that the actual lifting of the blocks at the end of their journey could have been made with a levering system kinds of small wooden cranes, maybe only towards the top of the building, because the upper third of its height represents only 4% of its mass. In that case, a levering system for the highest parts could have been complemented with ramps for lower levels. But the use of levers is not documented. We know that the Egyptians had a levered system for irrigation, called the shadouf, which was used to move water easily with minimum effort. But there is no formal proof that a bigger and more solid version of that was used at Giza. Now the pyramid, before the white limestone casing was applied to smooth its surface, had small steps, so maybe a multiplicity of these systems could have lifted the blocks one step at a time. There are more hypotheses that tend to be rejected by the academic mainstream. For example, that there was an internal ramp system, that the pyramid was not built from the ground up, but around the core as a spiraling series of levels, so that the structure of the pyramid itself would have been used as a ramp. This one is often discarded for its complexity and lack of any evidence. It could be technically possible, but it looks like a long shot. Another theory, and this one is widely rejected, was that the Egyptians did not actually bring the blocks. They made them directly on site and on the monument with a kind of limestone concrete. What we would take for blocks would actually be a concrete. There are many arguments against that, and they include the fact that the analysis of blocks point to regular limestone, or the fact that quarries where the blocks were cut exist. The shapes of the blocks separated from the rock are even visible, so why would they have bothered to extract all these blocks if they didn't need to? So the building techniques remain somewhat mysterious at this point. It is not really that there are no explanations at all, it is that there are several that look possible, but none of them is fully satisfactory. Hence the idea that there could have been a combination of methods to lift and place the blocks. But what we lack is definitive proof. 
Now that we have talked about the outside and the hypothesis about the building, let's take a look at the inside and also at the complex that once surrounded the pyramid, of which very little is left. But this is important to understand its function. For the size of the monument, there is not that much inside. Essentially, three main chambers, a passage called the Grand Gallery, and various smaller corridors and shafts. Initially, there was a single entrance to the pyramid. It is located on the north side, and the entrance is topped by a row of double chevrons that divert weight away from it. This entrance opens on a small, narrow, descending passage. The entrance is about 56 feet or 17 meters above ground, above the base level, and this passage inside descends approximately to the base level before starting to rise. But a second entrance, called the Robbers Tunnel, was dug at a lower level than the main entrance, and this passage, dug in stone, rejoins with the descending passage. It is not known exactly when this tunnel was dug, possibly during the time of ancient Egypt or after, but it was already here in the Middle Ages. At the end of this descending passage, there is a square hole in the ceiling. And through this hole, you can access another passage, ascending this one, that takes you up towards the center of the pyramid, where the room called the King's Chamber is located. This opening in the ceiling is not practical at all. And obviously it was not intended to be a corridor for people to circulate. It was just a way of bringing the mummy of the pharaoh and his treasures to the burial chamber before closing down the pyramid forever. It is believed that this entrance was hidden by a block initially, and putting it in the ceiling was a way of hiding it but it was found and removed long ago. Now the descending passage does not end here. It keeps descending into the bedrock. And this part was dug, presumably before the pyramid was built, above. And it leads to a subterranean chamber. This one is located 27 meters or 89 feet below base level. So it is deep underground and it is fairly large. It is rectangular and measures roughly 27 feet by 46 feet, or 8 by 14 meters, with an approximate height of 4 meters, 13 feet. This size contrasts with other chambers and even more with all the corridors and passages, which are very narrow. This was not necessarily a choice. The weight of the pyramid is such that you just cannot have large void inside. But in this underground chamber, deep into the bedrock, it was possible. The exact function of this underground chamber is unknown. If there was something here, it was taken away long ago. Because this chamber was already well known in the antiquity. Greek authors like Herodotus mentioned it, and it was already empty back then. It has been suggested that it could have been the intended burial chamber for Khufu, but that it would have been abandoned during the construction for the other chamber located up the king's chamber. So returning to where the ascending passage began, if we take it on about 40 meters of distance, moving upward inside the pyramid, 
we reach a point where we can either keep going up and enter a narrow but very high gallery called the Grand Gallery, or we can take a horizontal passage. The Grand Gallery leads to the King's Chamber, whereas the horizontal passage leads to a room called the Queen's Chamber. It is called the Queen's Chamber, but its function is unknown. Actually, kings and queens in ancient Egypt would be buried on the same site, but not in the same tomb. So the function of this room is unknown, and it was also found empty. It had been reached by looters long ago. This queen's chamber is located exactly halfway between the north and south faces of the pyramid. It is uh, obvious that having this room was planned all along. It was not dug in blocks, but it was paved and walled. And it has a pointed roof, here again most probably to distribute weight above it. Going back along the horizontal passage and rising through the grand gallery, we can reach the king's chamber. This grand gallery is impressive. It is narrow and gets narrower as we go up. Its width decreases from 7 feet or 2 meters at the start to only 3.5 feet or 1 meter at the end. But the ceiling is 28 feet high. So in the complete darkness of the pyramid, it was too far, too high to be seen. At the end of the gallery is the last line of defense of the king's chamber. An antechamber that was designed to house portcullis blocking stones. Three large granite stones, doors, were placed in slots and dropped supposedly after the pharaoh was buried. The portcullis stones were thick about 20 inches or 50 centimeters thick each one. But they obviously were not enough because they could still be destroyed and they were. And also the antechamber had a design flow. A space was left above these big stones between their top and the ceiling. So they could be circumvented except the last one. Crossing this antechamber, we finally reach the king's chamber, which is located about halfway between the base and the top of the pyramid. It was found empty, with only a broken stone sarcophagus, where, supposedly, the mummy of Khufu was one day placed probably surrounded with the artifacts and the treasures that would accompany him in the afterlife. But all was looted long ago, during the antiquity. Above the roof of the king's chamber, there are five compartments that were presumably intended to safeguard the king's chamber from the possibility of the roof collapsing. This is why these compartments were called reliving chambers. It is in these compartments that these graffiti left by workers were discovered in the 19th century, helping to attribute the pyramid to Khufu. I told you before that after Khufu, the size of pyramids decreased. The rest of the site of Giza, which has three main pyramids and smaller ones, was built over approximately a century. But the other ones are smaller. And after the fourth dynasty, the size of pyramids decreased. And these cores of stone blocks were replaced by bricks. The fourth dynasty was during the Old Kingdom. By the Middle Kingdom, the practice of building pyramids declined over time, and during the New Kingdom, in the 2nd millennium BC, 
the second half of the millennium. Pharaohs and nobles were buried, preferably, in underground tombs that still required work, but nothing near the building of a pyramid like Khufu's. So why did they stop building pyramids? There may not be a single reason, but it is likely that this practice became unsustainable for Egypt as a country and as a society. Maybe for ecological reasons, I mentioned before that wood consumption, especially as fuel to make mortar, was huge in a country with few wood. And maybe also for social reasons. Pharaohs may have been seen as living gods, but maybe there was so much a society was ready to accept to honor them. Pharaohs kept building, but they increasingly invested in temples or smaller monuments that may have been seen as more useful and more acceptable. In any case, there was also a temple associated to the pyramid, presumably dedicated to the cult of Khufu after his death. It stood on the east side of the pyramid and has almost entirely disappeared. And there was also a causeway that linked the pyramid to the river. Only a few remnants of it remain. There was also a cemetery to the east of the pyramid, where the tomb of Khufu's mother was found, but her coffin was empty, even though it had been sealed and never violated. This is maybe another mysterious story that happened there, and we will never know what happened. A lot of the archaeological work on the site has also consisted in studying the surroundings. And these studies have revealed that there once was a thriving port, so probably an economic activity, maybe around Khufu's temple. There were barracks for soldiers or workers, and plenty of remains left by the thousands of men, at times the tens of thousands, that worked, ate, lived, slept on the site, forming a, a town, even a temporary city. If only these thousands of workers who contributed to create one of mankind's most impressive ancient monuments could talk, maybe the mystery of exactly how the pyramid was built could be explained. Our night is not over yet. I have a second story for you, and a very different one. Do you know about the Mary Celeste, one of the most puzzling stories of ghost ship ever? This is what we are going to explore. Before we begin, let me remind you that there are timestamps in the first comment pinned under this video together with links to audio streaming services if you prefer to listen to my stories on Spotify, Apple Music and other platforms like these ones. And also a link to my Patreon, which is where this channel is funded. This allows me to avoid sponsorships and ad breaks in all videos, and it benefits everyone. So if you wish to join, you are very welcome. And you will get the possibility to download everything as audio or video and listen to the stories as podcasts. Now let's return to our stories with the story of the Mary Celeste. Our story begins on the day of December 1872, in the North Atlantic Ocean, of the Azores Islands. On the horizon, the crew of a Canadian commercial ship 
the Dei Gracia, saw the sails of another ship of the same kind, a brigantine, that is to say, a sailing vessel with two masts. The other ship seemed to be in a disheveled condition and adrift. So the Dei Gracia approached, and a closer observation confirmed that there was apparently no one on board. Several men from the Dei Gracia boarded the mysterious ship, and observed that the lifeboat was missing. But apart from that, there were still ample provisions on board the ship. She was loaded with a cargo of denatured alcohol, that is to say, pure alcohol for industrial or medical use. And when they inspected the cabins, they saw that the crew's personal belongings were still there, some of them valuable. They also found the ship's log. The last entry was dated ten days earlier. Like the Dei Gracia, this ship had left America bound to Genoa, Italy, and the plan was to transport this cargo of alcohol across the Atlantic, then enter the Mediterranean Sea through the Gibraltar Strait before reaching Italy. The ship's name was Mary Celeste, and this was just the beginning of a puzzling mystery. Where did the Mary Celeste come from? Her keel had been laid twelve years earlier in Nova Scotia, Canada, so she was still a relatively new ship. At the time, in the 1860s and 70s, a large part of the transatlantic trade was still done with sailing vessels. Steamships existed, but they had not yet replaced this mean of transport, which was cheaper, well-known, and still profitable. Modern shipping companies were barely forming at the time, and they had not taken over maritime trade. So a lot of independent ships and small companies ensured most of exchanges between Europe and America. The ship had been named Mary Celeste three years earlier, and was registered in the United States, because from 1861 she had sailed under the name Amazon as a Canadian ship, working mainly in the West Indies trade. But in 1867, so five years before she was found by the Dei Gracia, she had been driven ashore in a storm near Cape Breton Island in Nova Scotia and was so badly damaged that her owners abandoned her as a wreck. The wreck was sold several times at a cheap price and indeed as the property of an American mariner from New York who restored it and registered the ship under a new name, Mary Celeste, as an American vessel. She was sold again and this time was bought by a sea captain from Massachusetts, Benjamin Briggs, who had acquired a good standing in his profession and had decided to invest his savings in a ship. Briggs was experienced and perfectly capable of commanding this type of vessel. The Mary Celeste had just been refitted in New York City, and her first journey, under her new name, Mary Celeste, would be this transatlantic crossing from New York City to Genoa, with this cargo of uh, 1,700 barrels of alcohol. This was supposed to be a safe, almost routine journey, on a ship that had sailed for years before it was wrecked and refitted. So much so that for her inaugural transatlantic journey under a new name and a new owner, 
Benjamin Briggs arranged for his wife and his daughter to travel with him. Apart from them, he had recruited a crew of seven, so there were ten in total on board. In November 1872, the Mary Celeste left New York Harbor for a voyage that was supposed to last a few weeks, and a month later, she was found adrift and uh, abandoned in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. The loss of a ship due to the weather or attacks by pirates was not something uh, uncommon. But these two explanations looked immediately off in that case. The Mary Celeste had not been damaged. There was a bit of disorder on the deck in the sails, but the ship was still seaworthy, much safer than a lifeboat, and it did not make any sense to imagine that an experienced captain would have ordered the evacuation of a perfectly seaworthy ship in the middle of the ocean to board on a tiny and unstable lifeboat. Piracy did not work either because personal belongings and the ship's cargo were still there. There was no trace of fighting, and pirates operated near coasts and islands, not in the middle of the Atlantic. Something was off, and no reason for the abandonment could be found. The Dei Gracia and the Mary Celeste were similar ships, so the captain sent some of his crew to the Mary Celeste, and the two ships sailed to Gibraltar, where he intended to have the salvage of the Mary Celeste acknowledged. This would give him a right to a substantial share of her value. An investigation and hearings took place in Gibraltar confirming the mystery of the crew's disappearance. Months had passed, and the lifeboat had not reappeared. It never would, and the death, or at least the disappearance, of the ten passengers and crew members was confirmed. Why would an entire crew abandon a good ship with its cargo? Several possible explanations were put forward. The first one was full play. What if the captain of the Dei Gracia was in fact responsible for murdering and stealing the ship? Or what if he had conspired with Briggs, the captain and owner of the Mary Celeste, to organize an insurance fraud? It was said that the two captains could have known each other. They both were from the American East Coast. They had the same profession and were on the same route from the US to Genoa. But this did not really resist scrutiny. First, because the Mary Celeste had sailed several days prior. And even if they were on the same route, the probability that the Dei Gracia found it adrift was really thin. There was also the ship's log that had been interrupted ten days before the salvage. This did not fit the attack theory. And also both captains were honorably known and certainly smart enough to organize a less complicated and ambiguous fraud if they had wanted to conspire. Another theory was that the entire crew may have feared an explosion and taken refuge on the lifeboat. The cargo was alcohol, a highly explosive material of course, and wooden barrels could let fumes escape. What if someone had lighted something on deck, like a lamp or a lighter, and provoked an explosion because of the accumulation of gas, or if the density of fumes 
had reached a point where it would detonate. A brief explosion would not have necessarily destroyed the ship, and it could explain some of the disorder found on board. The rope that tied the lifeboat to the ship had been cut, which indicated a quick escape. So in that case, the entire crew would have been afraid of a second, bigger explosion, and would have put a distance between them and the ship. This was not totally convincing. First, because no traces of burning were found, not fully incompatible with a brief blast due to fumes, but surprising and uncommon at least. And also Briggs knew what he was carrying, and these small explosions due to fumes detonating on ships loaded with oil or alcohol were common. They were not a structural risk. So the abandonment in a panic looked uh, unsustainable. If the reason was not internal, it could have been external. What about natural phenomena? A bit of water was found inside, at the bottom of the ship. Again, not an uncommon thing for wooden ships. There were pumps to uh, evacuate it. So a theory was that maybe a malfunction of the pumps could have caused uh, alarm and prompted the evacuation. A sounding rod was found on deck, out of place. They may have used the rod to sound the level of water inside the boat and be alarmed by a wrong reading, indicating a much higher level of water which, combined with the pumps not functioning, would have been alarming indeed. That would have indicated that the ship was sinking. That's not impossible, but that would be a lot of coincidences and misjudgments on a ship which was not visibly sinking. So here again, this explanation is dubious. Other natural explanations include the possibility of a sea quake, an earthquake underwater, that would have caused huge turbulences. But here again, you don't take refuge on a lifeboat in the middle of the ocean when you are on a ship that is still seaworthy. It would harm your chances of survival, not improve them. What does not help to build solid hypotheses is that a number of myths and false histories were added in the decades that followed. Newspapers retold the story with invented details. The press in the 19th century had generally little regard for the truth and accuracy. So, some newspapers changed the location of the salvage, for example, to other parts of the Atlantic Ocean, like near the Cape Verde Islands. An alleged survivor spoke to the press in 1913, 41 years after the salvage. But it was a fraud, and stories of sea monsters also emerged, like a giant squid that would have plucked off all the passengers one by one and taken away the lifeboat for good measure. This was a revival of the legend of the Kraken, this giant octopus or squid that would attack ships. But as far as we know, the Kraken is a mythical creature. Other hypotheses include a moment of group hysteria may be due to alcohol fumes. This is something that experts discarded on an open deck. And so, without a definitive explanation, the case was closed. It was still suspicious, and the captain of the Dei Gracia was only awarded a small share of the salvage, which reflected the ongoing suspicions against him at the hearings 
even though they were not proven. The Mary Celeste was finally sent to Genoa, and then she was sold at a discount price because of her bad reputation. A partnership of New York businessmen bought it, and she continued her career for 11 more years, apparently an uneven full one, and it ended in 1884, 12 years after the salvage. The current owners at the time organized an insurance fraud. They filled the Mary Celeste with a worthless cargo that was misrepresented as valuable goods on the ship's manifest, and they insured the cargo for $30,000, a small fortune at the time, equivalent to about one million of today's dollars. Then the ship was voluntarily wrecked near the coast of Haiti. Unfortunately for the owners, the insurance company's investigation quickly exposed the attempted fraud, and nothing was ever paid. On the contrary, the conspirators were tried for their crime. The Mary Celeste was no more, and to this day, The mystery of the loss of her crew and her salvage remains unexplained. We have reached the end of our journey for tonight. I will now let you enjoy the sounds of the campfire for a little while, and I'll be back soon for another story. Sleep well, sweet dreams. Au revoir.